I didn't try them. I was speculating because I've tasted your cooking before. So. That sounds worse. I mean, you're really good at cooking. You are good at cooking, actually. Sorry, I didn't do that. Uh, I have one more for you, and this one isn't new. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna read the, the one that I've been reading the, uh, for the whole, um, for our whole tour, whatever you want to call it. Um, tour. Tour. Yeah, it's our, it's our, it's our tour. Um, and it's called, uh, it's called uh, the places we end up at. And um, I have a little Kindle moment here. There's a physical book right there, too. I, I know. You won't be... No, no, you're fine. Yes, why don't you spiel for a bit? Okay. Um, this is a, a fly... I, I recently tied a bunch of these for a friend who's fishing the upper Amazon for Golden Dorado, which is a... It, 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 I've never heard of the fish before, but uh, he'd been there once before, and I watched some YouTube videos on these fish that are out of the water more than they're in when you hook them. Just incredible! It's an incredible trip. But uh, he's a, a sculptor, so I traded some flies for some metal sculpture. But it's a it's a fun fly to tie, and it goes along with the story that Chad read at the uh, King's English that I'm reading down there. So it actually fit that story. It has nothing to do with the story that he's reading tonight. It's a cool fly. <laughs> because we were at the King's English, and I was tying it. He, the owner of the store, I don't remember his name, Rob, Rob, Rob yeah. was behind, was over my shoulder taking pictures. And there's a point in this fly where I, I wrap deer hair and pull it, and the, the hair flares out. And every time I did that, I heard this <laughs> over my shoulder. Because he, he hadn't seen it before. It was impressed, so I'm going to try to dash Or did he think you were screwing it up? Like, oh no, he's. Oh, no, I've never crossed this. <laughs> no, so, yeah, what was the fly called again? I call just, it a pike fly. It's just a oh, I thought fly. this was the the green headed monster or whatever the the derogatory green headed twister. Twister, yeah. Well, that's what I called it on the radio. Okay. <laughs> nobody could see it because it was like a vulgar shout out to your cronies, right? It's like some kind of let's just, just call it an inside joke. So. <laughs> yeah, the green headed oh. twister. Okay. <laughs> All right, this fly is also known as the green head. <laughs> then have a green head. Okay, um, yeah, so this is called The Places We End Up. And um, so you're going to read, what are you reading? I'm, I'm reading uh, Good Place to Make Saints. Though. Yeah, so another one that kind of touches on yeah. religion and stuff. And so, yeah, so I, I guess that Russ is thinking about spirituality and stuff, and I'm thinking about all the times so that I screwed everything up while going fishing. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is, and this is another one that's, yeah, it's about a, you know, a fishing trip that was supposed to be really spectacular and kind of maybe didn't work out as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, the places we end up uh, interpreted in a green head twister. Brad calls the motel around 8 p.m. to tell them we're on the interstate and about two hours away, but will there be someone to check us in when we arrive? I should mention my use of the word motel in this case is generous. We're heading to a cluster of shoddy cabins out back of an old roadside stopover. It doesn't matter whether it was originally a gas station that became a gift shop or a diner that became a convenience store because it is now all of those things and the one thing it is not is a motel. All night check-in is one of the many conveniences they do not boast. Air conditioning, ice, and room service are a few others and we are surely closer to the continental divide than the nearest swimming pool or hot tub. They have no Wi-Fi. For all I know, they are still awaiting the arrival of Hi-Fi. Hmm. The proprietress of this establishment tells Brad the diner closes at 10 p.m. Her name is Brandy. She says, if we get there before then, someone can give us a key to our cabin. If we get there after, we can go around back and find the key under or next to something somewhere. But that is wor worrisomely complicated, and so Paul drives a little faster. We exit the interstate and pull into the gravel parking lot with about 120 seconds to spare, but no more than that. Through the windows of the diner, we see Brandy closing up. She wears way too much makeup and spray-on tan for someone her age, and her attempt to flirt with Russ would be awkward even if she were much younger. <laughs> However, she wins us over by treating us not as paying customers, but as distant and unexpected in-laws who are in need of a place to crash. So, she says, you're here. We admit that we are. 
She asks if we want to pay with cash or check, and in return we ask her if we can split our bill four ways so, if she, so we can each pay separately. Well, she says, that makes it harder for me. No one says anything for a few seconds. <laughs> so, can you or can't you, says Paul. Yeah, I can. She runs our, as she runs our cards, we ask her how business has been. She sighs and says her best employee is out of commission tonight because she had to go into jail to bail her boyfriend. She had to go into town to bail her boyfriend out of jail. We nod and pretend to know how tough it is when your best employee has to go into town to bail her boyfriend out of jail. <laughs> Brandy just shrugs and says everything will be fine in the morning. I mean, how long can it take to bail one guy out of jail, right? We nod some more. Brandy shows us to our cabin, the interior of which would not be unfamiliar to anyone who has been detained in an internment camp. <laughs> Once we've dropped our bags and rod cases, we notice the cabin has only three beds. So Brandy takes us to the cabin next door, where she keeps a couple rollaway cots that appear to have been in service since the Roosevelt administration, and I mean Teddy. She points out which is the better of the pair, and Russ helps me roll it down the boardwalk to our cabin. Brandy watches Russ as he pushes the rollaway. You're tall, she says. How tall are you? Once inside the room, I unfold the cot, and there in the center of the mattress is an evil colored stain about the diameter of a good-sized dinner plate. Russ and I exchange a horrified glance, but Brandy is unfazed. I realize that it falls to me to be embarrassed on behalf of us all, and so I quickly flip the mattress over. On the other side, the stain is even larger. <laughs> Try again, says Russ. <laughs> I turn the mattress back over and say, we're sure this is the best one. Yeah, says Brandy, wrinkling her nose. The other one has mice living in it. <laughs> These are the places we end up when we decide it's time for a fishing trip. The convenience store that sells car batteries, handmade costume jewelry, and expired Tylenol side by side on the same shelf. Or the filling station that makes the best fried chicken in the entire region, but has a restroom so foul you'd use it only in case of great emergency. Greasy places, smelly places, but open places too. Brandy brings some linen and bedding. I use both sheets to double wrap the mattress like a corpse. As soon as I lie down, I pretty much know how sore I'll be in the morning. This mattress will hit me in my lower back and hips because it sags in the middle exactly like a hammock, and there are good reasons one does not see many hammocks in the bedrooms of Western civilization. This is one of the very few advantages of Spartan travel accommodations. You at least know how much worse it can get, and you're unsurprised when it does. We did most of our talking in the truck, so we flip off the lights and turn in. Outside in the parking lot, idling big rigs growl ceaselessly through the night. A sodium arc lamp on a high mast floods the cabin with ruddy electric moonlight. Clouds of big moths swarm in the glare, and occasionally they land on the window where they dance in circles and figure eight patterns. Next morning, we're up and in the stream before the sun gets there. We catch a few fish. I hook and lose a nice brown practically on my first cast. However, as the day advances, there seems to be a discrepancy. I came on this trip for the superb fishing, and the fishing is not superb. My attitude deteriorates, and that makes me fish poorly, which makes me catch even less. They're in here, says Brad. He's hammering away at the deeper water with his nymphs. You know they're in here. We just have to figure it out. I hate it when Brad says that because that's what Brad says when the fishing sucks. And you can't pretend you don't mind. As soon as you tell yourself it's not about the fish, that's when you know the fish are exactly what it's about. And this is another place we end up. Somewhere where the fishing ought to be good, but is not, and the river offers no explanation. As the day grows hot, the fishing worsens, though that seems hardly possible. Russ and I fish a brushy technical stretch of stream, breathtaking for the massive potential of its shady pocket water and plunge pools, but we catch nothing. Brad and Paul's afternoon is much the same, so we take a break and eat some lunch. Paul drives us around the countryside to reconnoiter various other waterways, and we even stop to visit with some landowners for local intel. I fall asleep in the truck a couple of times. Evening comes and it cools off. We return to the stream to s and split up, to refish various sections that performed poorly in the heat of the day. I've given up hope for, of a 50 fish day, or even a 20 fish day. I go up the road a mile or so to a deep bend in the stream where we caught a few nice fish that morning. As I approach the river and find a good spot to begin, I see animals moving in the high grass at the bank. It's a herd of 20 or more bighorn sheep. 
They emerge from the grass and pass within 20, uh, 50 feet of me before climbing a rocky hillside. It's juveniles and ewes with horns that don't curl all the way around. Their orderly but slightly nervous procession reminds me of a grade school class during a fire drill. 60 seconds later, they've climbed over the hill and out of sight. I walk to the spot and stand there in the laid over grass where the little herd had been resting and drinking. They've left, me home. they've left behind a faint animal odor. As I survey the water for rising fish, there are none. It occurs to me that all around me is silence, and I mean silence. No breeze or bird song. The low gradient stream makes no sound, and there are no trucks moving along the dirt road. It stays this way for a long time. It's a rare and utterly welcome sensation, and it's where I want it to end up all along. Thanks. Why don't you tell us who Brad is? So Brad is a guy who used to live here in the valley, and, and Russ and I fished with him. And we all kind of started fishing um, kind of at the same time. Uh, Brad had started to fish recently, and I had started to fish recently, and, and, and Russ kind of started fishing with us for his first few trips and we all sort of figured it out together and stuff and the thing the, the interesting thing about brad is that he eventually um became so good at fly fishing that he he's now a, a fishing guide in montana while russ and i still suck yeah <laughs> you know like six or eight years later we still kind of suck at fishing and while brad is you know the pro he's getting paid you know to, to fish and, uh, and, and, and in the book, if you read the book, um, we kind of paint him as this, you know, this heroic figure. If there is a hero in the book, it's him. It's yeah. neither of us. So, yeah. Uh, Brad, and, and, and Brad also taught us kind of everything we know about the new thinking about conservation, which is that, you know, we kind of think that, that there was this unspoiled landscape and settlers moved into it and, and it became kind of the polluted and, and, and uh, kind of trashed environment it is now, whereas Brad taught us, no, 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 everybody who lived in the landscape affected it, and, and you know, non-native species crossing borders and stuff like that is kind of a natural thing. So we, we learn from Brad, and we kind of watch how he fishes, and yeah, he's kind of our hero. And he's pictured in the book, if you want to see a picture of him. How's that? Yeah. That's my last one. Thank you all for coming very much, and, um, and uh, Russ is going to take us out. Okay.